Hello, and my name is Glenn Chestnut. I am the lead minister of the Church of St Andrew and St Paul here in downtown Montreal. And thank you for finding us online. It seems to be the new reality for many churches as we grapple with COVID-19. Because we are no longer able to meet in more than groups of two, we have changed our online format for you. Nevertheless, we hope you find your time with us an enjoyable time, a worthwhile time, and also a meaningful time, albeit different to the way we normally gather present in church. You can follow the flow of our services online, and we have our orders of service there for you to participate in, in either saying responses or indeed singing the hymns. Many people are now not able to attend their own place of worship. Others are searching for a place at a time of uncertainty. May I ask you to take some time and maybe share our Facebook pages, our YouTube channel and our website with them. And please do check our different online platforms from time to time. We will try and update you as best as we are possible on what is an ongoing uh, situation. May I also ask you to reflect upon how you might be able to support us online and especially the people behind the scenes who are making this experience possible. It's important for all of us to be assured at this time that we belong, that we belong to a community, in this instance a community of faith online. So you are welcome. You are welcome no matter who you are, and you are welcome no matter where you are. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all this Palm Sunday. Some words from Psalm 118. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, in the highest. Let us worship God today. Let us open in prayer. Let us pray. Dear God, you loved our world so much, so much that you embraced it in all of its suffering through your beloved son, Jesus. Jesus sought the way of the cross so that he might come to Easter and then offer us the way to you. Lord Jesus Christ, we see you entering the city of Jerusalem on that donkey's back. We see you with crowds waving their branches before you, singing and shouting, crying words of acclamation. And we too would praise you, not only with our lips, but with our minds and our hearts, and indeed our whole lives. We are so familiar with this picture of you. Help us with that other picture that we have of you. Walking alone to Calvary, bleeding, stumbling, mocked by your enemies, sadly deserted and betrayed by your friends. That journey you take on your own. Help us to understand this deeper reality. A reality which says that your loving surrender, your bleeding obedience, takes you into your kingdom. And help us see that it is here that we see the true marks of that kingdom. And be with us now in our worship, and indeed through this coming week, that we may see you crucified, that we may call you truly King. And before your love made plain, we confess our lovelessness. Before your everlasting and enduring faith, we admit our faithlessness. And before our human condition, our weakness, often our blindness, sometimes cruelty, 
we come today humbly and accept our responsibility before you and with one another then we confess our brokenness our brokenness in the ways that we wound our lives indeed the lives of others and the very life of our world show us once again the wonder of your eternal mercy here before us ever coming to us issuing forth from your living accepting sacrifice and may we be content to live in your love alone, a love which breaks down every barrier that draws us closer to you and to each other. And as we enter this fateful week, we wait and watch the journey, a journey which changed everything. God of light, give us vision, grant us sight, that through our attentiveness to the pain and the glory of your Son's way, our faith may be deepened, our compassion increased, and importantly, our hope reborn. So may the timelessness and transforming mystery of Easter come to birth again in our lives, here and now. And we ask all of this through Jesus Christ, who taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen.
Psaume 118 Louez l'Éternel, car il est bon, car sa miséricorde dure à toujours. Qu'Israël dise, car sa miséricorde dure à toujours. Ouvrez les portes de la justice, j'entrerai, je louerai l'Éternel. Voici la porte de l'Éternel, c'est par elle qu'entre les justes. Je te loue parce que tu m'as exaucé, parce que tu m'as sauvé. La pierre qu'ont rejeté ceux qui bâtissaient est devenue la principale de l'angle. C'est de l'Éternel que cela est venu, c'est un prodige à nos yeux. C'est ici la journée que l'Éternel a faite, qu'elle soit pour nous un sujet d'allégresse et de joie. Ô Éternel, accorde ton salut. Ô Éternel, donne la prospérité. Béni soit celui qui vient au nom de l'Éternel, nous vous bénissons de la maison de l'Éternel. L'Éternel est Dieu et il nous éclaire. Attachez la victime avec des liens, amenez-la jusqu'aux cornes de l'autel. Tu es mon Dieu et je te louerai. Mon Dieu, je t'exalterai. Louez l'Éternel car il est bon, car sa miséricorde dure à toujours.
The second lesson is from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. Listen for God's word. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, the Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, look, your king is coming to you, humble, and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. The word of God. Thanks be to God. Hello. This is the time of our service when normally the ushers come down the aisles and collect the offering. But obviously in this new format, we cannot do that in the same way. Yet we know that many of you want to continue to support the work of St. Andrew and St. Paul. During these times, we're able to provide you with worship opportunities, as well as the other service that we do both within the congregation and the wider community. So let me tell you that the good news is, in virtual worship, we can provide virtual offering. And let me explain to you some of the ways in which that can happen. One is to use your smartphone. And if you text the number 2022, then you'll be able to enter in AP and be given instructions how you can make a donation. And that amount will appear on next month's phone bill for you. If you want a tax receipt, that can also be arranged. If you're more old school, you may want to use one of these, a good old check. And for you younger people, this is the old way in which we used to exchange money from one person to another. You can fill out a check to the Church of St. Andrew and St. Paul and include it in one of these. Put it in the mailbox. Again, something that we don't often do anymore. If you're more new school, then you could arrange an e-transfer from your bank to our bank. And uh, that is, again, an easy way in which to make a donation. If you go onto our website and scroll to the very bottom, you'll see a button that says Donate. And if you go to that, all of these ways are explained, including being able to donate through your credit card. That amount, uh, again, will go directly, and you can even collect air miles, although who knows when on earth you'll be able to use them. Finally, if you're a regular contributor, consider using PAR pre-authorized remittances, so that an amount comes directly out of your bank to ours, much like your hydro bill or something like that. That amount can be changed or stopped at any time, but it ensures that the revenue uh, continues to our church upon which we depend. In this way, we can respond to the generosity of God with our own generosity. Thank you. Let us pray. Dear Lord, your word sustains the weary. You bind up the brokenhearted and bring good news to the poor. And as you enter into the chaos of Jerusalem, we trust that you come to us in whatever turmoil we are experiencing just now. As some of us are able to shout your praises, Others perhaps cannot even murmur a word of hope. Yet, you see all of us perhaps lined up by the road, getting essentials, waiting in stores. 
isolated in our homes, possibly incarcerated, incapacitated perhaps, worried about our loved ones and those who are ill, exhausted from caring for the sick and labouring at essential work. In all of this, you are moved with compassion. You come to Jerusalem, getting ever closer to that cross, pouring yourself out in order to bring forgiveness, reconciliation and salvation. Sometimes we do not know how to voice our deepest needs or fears or hopes or longings, yet we are confident that you know them all before even a word passes our lips. And so today we cast everything before you, trusting your promise of an easy yoke and a light burden. And we call for the healing of the sick. We call for relief for the suffering, for justice for the oppressed for those to be relieved who are exhausted, hope for the downtrodden, and comfort for those who mourn. And as we wonder what will happen next, as we struggle with countless uncertainties and mounting anxieties, we look to you for help. We look to you for assurance and for that peace that passes all understanding. And as we draw closer to you, as we attempt to follow you, even to that cross, we can rejoice in your near presence. And we give thanks to you for your selfless sacrifice. We give thanks for those healthcare professionals, those people behind the scenes in hospitals and in research facilities people who are working, essential workers, to keep our society functioning, different forms of governance to keep our society ordered and well-informed, and all frontline responders. We remain grateful for all those on the way with us. And united in you, Lord Jesus, we can journey together and be in solidarity for those who have fallen by the wayside. We can be with those who fear that they have been forgotten. By your Spirit, strengthen us for the days ahead so that we may remain faithful to you, your will and your calling until we see you face to face. Father, Son and Holy Spirit, we give you praise and thanks this day. Amen.
Welcome to our home. We live in Point Claire, very close to Lac Saint Louis, and this is a sunroom that we have. It's a beautiful room with lots of windows and light that pours in all times of the day. And this is the room where I normally work to prepare sermons, and today it's the place where I get to preach a sermon. So welcome to our home. Many people have argued that we get more of our theology out of the hymns that we sing than out of the scriptures that we read. And I think this is often the case. Music has a way of finding a path into our brains and staying there in ways that words alone do not. That's why jingles are such an effective way of advertising, because we remember the music and therefore the product. I think I could probably sing for you 10 jingles from my childhood that I learned then and have never left my memory for everything from SO gas to Gillette Blue Blades to Carling Black Label Beer, things that no longer even exist except in my memory and in those jingles. And so when we sing the same hymns every year to remember a particular event in Jesus' life, often it is through those hymns that we imagine what took place. They color how we think of 
and remember those events. So, for example, how do you imagine Bethlehem when Jesus was born? My guess is that you probably think of it as that little town of Bethlehem that lay still. We think of the night as a silent and holy night when all was calm and bright. But of course, none of those details are told us by Luke and his gospel. In fact, if anything, it could well have been that Bethlehem was complete bedlam when Jesus was born, with too many people and too little space for them. And yet in our mind, through carols like a little town of Bethlehem and Silent Night, we have a very clear vision of this calm, still, beautiful little town. In the same way, on Palm Sunday, today, we remember that event as Jesus entered Jerusalem through the hymns that we have sung. And my guess is that for many of us, we imagine it as a festive parade. Streets filled with laughing, happy children, waving wildly palm branches and singing. Hosanna, loud Hosanna, little children sing. All glory, laud, and honor to thee, Redeemer King, to whom the lips of children the sweet Hosannas ring. And of course, that's complemented by how we often celebrate Palm Sunday, not only at St. Andrew and St. Paul, but in other churches as well. It's a time when we tend to put a spotlight on children, when they sing special songs for us and perhaps wave palm branches as well. We think of this as a parade like some of the parades that we know, like perhaps the postponed, canceled St. Patrick's Day parade, but without the green beer and shamrocks. We picture people lining the streets, waiting with expectation for what is about to take place. But I would think that the reality of that scene was very different. Matthew uh, says that there was a large crowd that gathered when Jesus entered Jerusalem. But I think we should take that description with a grain of salt. First, because neither Mark nor Luke in their telling of the story mention the crowd in that way. But also because a large crowd, especially one that was whelping a new king, would have brought the wrong kind of attention. Romans did not take lightly any pretenders to the throne or anyone who threatened Roman authority. And my guess is that they would have very quickly taken Jesus if a large crowd had gathered around him. No, I don't think this was a parade like our parades, where people wait for hours in expectation. This was a pop-up parade. It was a spontaneous parade. The only one who prepared for it at all was Jesus, who sent disciples to fetch a donkey upon which he would ride in entering the city. And in doing so, he incorporated the words of the prophet Zechariah that Matthew also quoted, Shout loudly, daughter of Zion, your king comes, your king comes, triumphant and victorious, riding on a donkey in humility. Jesus wanted people to know that he was not a warrior king. He came as a harbinger of peace. His reign would not be one that came with violence, but in humility and in meekness. Jesus' entry into Jerusalem was, was an important entry for him. Jerusalem, after all, was the city that David has established as the capital of the nation and where his son Solomon had built the first temple. It was the center of Jewish identity. And pilgrims would come from throughout the Jewish diaspora to worship at the temple, and especially, of course, during the festivals like Passover. It was also the place where collusion was present between the Romans and some authorities of the city. And it was also a place where opposition to the Romans was strong, people who yearned for liberation. It was the place where, in fact, Jesus would come and his vision 
of the kingdom of God would clash with empire. Jesus proclaimed that a time was coming when God's justice would rule and all people would have everything they need, that people would unite in, in service to a God of love, of mercy, of kindness, of justice, and of hope. But that vision was about to be steamrolled by the vested interests who were the ones who wanted things to remain the way they were because, of course, it benefited them well. Were some people excited that Jesus was entering Jerusalem? Undoubtedly, they were. They were fed up with the way things were, fed up with the oppression that existed. But we get the distinct impression that they had the wrong impression of what was about to take place. When they shouted, Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, there was deep irony in what they said. Because they thought they were welcoming the new David, the warrior David, the triumphant and victorious David, the David who would change things and bring back the sovereign Israel. They were waiting for a miracle we would certainly find out that these expectations were not real. We would find out that, in fact, they would turn very quickly when they found out that they weren't. They would discover that Jesus' road to royalty was one that took him to the cross. And that it would be there that we would truly find out what kind of a king he would be. If we want a hymn to remember Palm Sunday by, I suggest it's right on, right on with majesty, a hymn with which we will end the service today. It's a, a beautiful hymn. It's a, it's a wonderfully told hymn. Each of the verses begins with that same sentence, right on, right on with majesty. But two of them then go on and say, in lowly pomp, right on to die. It celebrates the majesty of Jesus' entry into, into the city, his claim of kingship, the hope that came with that on Palm Sunday, but also it leads to the despair of Good Friday, the recognition that he was riding on to death. But yet through the death came the victory and in that, we began to understand the kind of Messiah Jesus was, the kind of king he came to be. Well, what has any of this got to do with a coronavirus a pandemic that we're living through that has altered all of our lives and is such an endless source of concern and worry for us? Certainly COVID-19 is proving to be a strong and relentless adversary that poses a double threat. First and foremost, of course, to those who are or who will get sick, some of whom will die. And we should recognize that among us gathered this morning, some of us are or will be infected. But as well, it has brought the economy to its knees and we don't know when or how or in what form it will ever return, if it will ever be the same again. And my guess is that many of us are waiting for a miracle in the form of a vaccine. And the vaccine will save us. It will return the world to the way it was and end this nightmare once and for all. So the vaccine becomes the savior for which we are waiting. And when one does come, we will greet its entry into our city with palm branches and shouts of Hosanna or whatever the equivalent may be. When a vaccine comes, then everything is going to be okay once again. But while we're waiting for that miracle, Suffering continues. Suffering for those who are sick, 
suffering for those who are isolated, suffering for those in destructive relationships who cannot find any form of escape, suffering for those with mental health issues who find isolation intolerable, suffering for those who can't pay rent, for those who are on the street who will be the most vulnerable and the most stricken. And suffering as well, of course, that is real for those who are taking care of those who are sick, who often find themselves powerless to provide the kind of help that they really want to, who worry about running out of protective equipment and therefore making themselves even more vulnerable to this virus than they already are. No suffering and sacrifice can't wait for the miracle. Let's remember that Jesus came to Jerusalem on a donkey, that he rode on to die, that his way was a way that would lead to suffering, that it would lead to his life being sacrificed for others, with dealing with his own fear and continuing to ride on. And in that way, it reminds us that Jesus stands with all those who are suffering and who sacrifice themselves for the well-being of others. To remind them that ultimately there is meaning going on and that ultimately God will vindicate. That's the message that the cross brings to us. And Jesus continues to stand in solidarity with all those who follow in his way. So maybe Jesus is already in the city. Maybe he's already at work and we haven't really taken notice. There were no palm branches being waved, no shouts of Hosanna. And yet quietly, unobtrusively, lovingly, while we wait for the miracle, that's the miracle that's already happening. And it's happening in hospitals and nursing homes, in factories, in government offices and laboratories, among neighbors and friends and all those who now are working doubly hard to ensure that the weak are being taken care of, to offer a word of hope instead of despair. Maybe the miracle is happening while we're waiting. Amen.
and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you, both now today and indeed forevermore. Amen.